Okay, let's get going. What do you say? Well, first, thank you to everyone for coming out this evening. I know there's uh, so many talks at the A School that you can become overwhelmed. Um, I was here last night. I'm going to be here tonight. I may be here tomorrow night. I don't know. I should just set up a bed in my office. Um, so thanks again. My name's Ellen Bassett, and I'm the chair of the Urban and Environmental Planning Program here. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the Plavnik Lecture this evening. So before I introduce the speakers and their very important topic, um, I should provide a few words about the Plavnik Lectureship itself. Uh, the Lectureship was established in 2003 uh, by Joan Plavnik Kame in memory of her late husband, Robert L. Pa Plavnik. He was one of our faculty members who used to teach up in Northern Virginia um, and did the master's program up there. Um, the purpose of this fund is, in fact, to support conversations about urban planning, about cities, um, and they're designed to, they're, sorry, they're linked to design and to the social issues that face us today. Um, the topic for this evening, Rethinking Refugee Communities, is indeed an important planning and design topic. Uh, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which you will hear much more about, I'm sure, estimates that worldwide there are 68.5 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. So I want to understand the forcibly part of that, right? They're moving because they have to. They're compelled by violence. They're compelled by food. There's any number of reasons that are moving people out of their countries elsewhere. So these are not so-called economic refugees. Of these 68.5 million people, 40 million are also internally displaced. So they're living within their own countries as well. But let's focus on that first group um, and think who takes the brunt of displaced people. Well, we know that in Turkey, there are 3.5 million refugees, mainly from Syria. Pakistan has approximately 1.3 million refugees, and they are mainly Afghans, displaced by what we are now calling America's longest war. And then finally, Uganda, where I used to live, in the north, there's a similar number, 1.3 million, and many of these are refugees from the Sudan. That is um, a real tragedy, that is for sure. The name refugee camp, which is the way we often refer to these things, is really misnamed. It's not a camp. You don't go to REI and pick up a tent. You don't sleep overnight and go on to something else. The average camp lasts 17 years. Um, one former uh, human rights worker called them the cities of tomorrow. Well, if you're a planning student, you should know that there's a famous book called Cities of Tomorrow by a guy named Peter Hall. It's not the same kind of cities they're talking about. The permanence of the refugee community was something that very few foresaw. So I'm going to relate this to my own experience. I lived in Kenya when Mogadishu fell, and when it fell the first of many times that it's fallen, it fell in 1991 uh, when Siad Barre's government crumbled. This is the time of Black Hawk Down, that kind of stuff that you might know from the films. Um, so thousands of Somalis fled into Kenya, and they ended up in the arid lands of Garissa County. Uh, that camp, uh, known as Dadaab, has been there since 1992. So you can do the math. That's 28 years. Uh, so 28 years later, people are living there. Um, the place has a, a nickname. It's called the City of Thorns, uh, representative, in fact, of what the landscape's like, but also perhaps quality of life. It's a place where people exist in stateless limbo. They're surviving. They're not necessarily flourishing. And if you know anything about the politics of Kenya, they've been trying to repatriate them to Somalia for quite a while now. So it's a hostile, hostile state. So the need for rethinking refugee communities could not be more important or more timely. Um, so we're excited today to have someone, have a group here to tell us about their work um, and the experience of ENIAD architects in this domain. So let me introduce the two principals to who are going to talk to us today. Um, Don Weinreich. Weinreich, sorry, is a partner at ENIAD Architects and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Eliza Montgomery is also AIA, and she joined the firm in 2012 and is an associate. Together, they are the project leads on Rethinking Refugee Communities Project. This is an award-winning collaboration between the ENIAD Lab, Stanford University, and the UNHCR. Oh, la, la, la. I just lost my place in what I was looking at. So sorry. The project explores the process of planning, building, and operating refugee settlements with the goal to nurture mutually beneficial relationships among refugees and the host communities. Uh, Weinrich and Montgomery have spoken and traveled extensively as part of this project, uh, participating in field missions to Rwanda, which we know there were certainly camps following the genocide, 
Jordan, Nepal. They were part of a panel session at the Habitat 3 conference in Quito and other interactive workshops held as part of the 2015, should I say SAID? SAID? SAID conference on forced migration, to name a few. They've also been teaching and running workshops on the subject at both the Pratt Institute and the New School. So we're, it's clear they're long overdue to come to UVA, so they are here, which is great. The project is part of ENIAD Lab, um, a function within their overall practice that's been devoted to transdisciplinary research that extends upon the normal bounds of architectural practice. So please join me in welcoming them both to UVA. Thank you. It's, uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Louder? No, good. Okay, great. I'm a soft talker, so if you can't hear, wave. Um, anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you, Ellen, for such a great introduction, and we'll roll right into it. Um, click. Or not. We were going to roll it. Okay. All right, should we use the mouse? No, you can use the mouse. Okay, now that'll work. Okay, so um, one of the, the things that's uh, a kind of tenet of our practice is this idea of rethinking every problem that's put in front of us. It keeps us fresh and, and alive as designers, and we've tried to cultivate a practice that, where we can apply that to all sorts of conventional architectural problems, like the reinvention of the, the research lab from a kind of box filled with test tubes and, and lab coats to a place that fosters a culture of collaboration, or hospitals that most of us think of as terrifying places that you don't want to go near, as you know, reimagining re them as civic buildings, um, uh, professional schools that tend to hide away as, as temples of, of knowledge hidden away to uh, engaging them directly with their communities and, and so forth. You, you get the idea. So I want to, before we launch into the main topic tonight, which uh, we'll get to in a minute, I want to explain a little bit more about ENIAD Lab and ENIAD Architecture Practice and why we created the lab at all. Um, I think, uh, at least for me personally, I never entirely wanted to leave school. And when you enter practice, you are constantly pursuing work and doing work. And it's this kind of cycle of always having to feed the monster, if you will, to. Uh, to uh, bring in enough work to sustain a practice, but there are all these other really interesting questions to ask and investigate, and you often don't have time to do, to do them when you're in the middle of a particular project. So a few years ago, we decided to create the lab, which we allocate formally 1% of our la annual labor hours, so that's actually about 2,000 labor hours a year, or something like that. Um, anyway, so it's a lot of time, and we get to work on really cool projects that we can then uh, reinvest what we've learned back back into the conventional practice. The example there that's uh, kind of faded back is research that we did in bird-safe glass to prevent bird strikes and bird deaths when they hit buildings, and that's now become a fairly common um, uh, piece of technology with buildings. But tonight we're going to talk about... Um, the reinvention or the rethinking of refugee camps and, and kind of repositioning them as something else. So we have tried very hard to avoid using the word camp, although I'm sure we'll regress and slip into it tonight. These camps are or, or were, were invented as a typology exactly the way Ellen described them as short-term stays for uh, to deal with crises that would resolve quickly. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth these days. So we prefer to call them settlements or communities and um, uh, kind of shift the nomenclature. Um, as mentioned earlier, the, the, the genesis of the project was these three entities coming together. Uh, it all started kind of as a random accident when a pro professor at the law school who I knew asked us to participate in a workshop run by the D School to kind of hack apart what's wrong with the way the UN um, uh, so supports refugee crises. And over the years, and actually I, I should come clean on Stanford has kind of faded away because their primary investigator in this topic moved on and is now on the California Supreme Court. But other institutions have come into play and 
Eliza and I in the lab and colleagues at UNHCR have kind of been the constant. So these are some of the other entities we've collaborated with over the years. So we're going to do a little bit of backing and forthing. <laughs> so over to you. So I mean, you guys I already you. you guys already heard some statistics tonight, but um, you know we, we're seeing the largest number of, of refugees ever, um, 68.5 million. Um, we, Ellen went over a few of these statistics already. There's all different kinds of um, forcibly displaced people. Um, and, but we're going we're gonna to focus tonight on refugees, but essentially sort of all the work we've been doing really applies to, to all these different types of people. Um, in addition to the 68.5 million that we're seeing today, uh, there are projections that because of climate change, as many as 143 million people are projected to be displaced by 2050. So, you know, we're, this is not an issue that's going away. Um, even though we are seeing the most number of refugees right now, there have been many, many refugees throughout our history, um, ever since the 1940s. And, and camps have been developed and designed for them ever, ever since then. It, traditional uh, methods that have been used to develop camps have been really catered towards a very short time frame, two years maximum. The hope, of course, is that the conflict will be resolved and refugees will be able to go back to their country of origin. As Ellen mentioned, that's not the case. Um, depending on exactly how you define it, you know, average length of protracted refugee camp now is anywhere from 17 years to 26 years. That's only average, so it it means that some camps are now 40, 40 years old. Um, it's not a short-term situation, and therefore we have to rethink how they're designed so that we sort of address this new, this, this new situation. We, we can't just design for an emergency uh, phase, which is what a lot of the guidelines are set up for. We have to design for many different phases of, of constant transformation. Um, even though these camps are very old, a, a lot of them, they still have a very transient population through the camp. So they have to be flexible. They have to allow for change. And towards, towards the end of a life lifespan of a camp, there could be multiple different outcomes, either one of integration, where the refugees really become part of this place, or there could be a, a situation where they can leave and go back to their host communities. But then, you know, what happens to all this infrastructure that, that was built? And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about statistics, but we really want to look at the people who are there as well. There are babies being born in these camps. Kids grow up. Uh, this, the on, this is the only places they've seen their whole childhood, and, and you know, people grow old in these camps. They, it, I think in some of the oldest camps, um, children are being born to, uh, to parents who already spent their whole life in the camp. So this is, this is really and truly their, their home. And then also we see lots of different environments and different cultures around the world. So because of this, there's never going to be one a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, you know, the landscape is different, the climate is different, the cultures are different. So we can't treat them the same. So we know that this problem is not going away. How can we sort of rethink and turn turn this crisis into an opportunity? Traditionally, the situation has been approached in a very one-directional way. Um, humanitarian actors and ho host governments work together to find solutions to keep refugees safe and provide aid for them. Um, in this one directional approach, the refugees are, they, they don't have agency. They are left to live in the place that is, is given to them. But what if we could rethink this and sort of um, treat all three sides like they are both the clients and the designers of the situation? What if we could find benefits that the refugees, the partners, and the hum humanitarians can all get out of this situation. And I actually want to point out 
um, the change in language from host governments to partners. We really like to think of the host government and the host community as a partner in their situation. They're not just the host. Um, and so in all of this, what is the role of the architect? Um, you know, these are very tense political and, and economic situations. What can we do as spatial planners? Um, just to sort of compare where we are today with, with architects' role back in history, I mean, of course, in the 60s, urban slums um, were, were treated, uh, architects did have a big role in, in treating those. They were supported by governments to, um, you know, go through urban re renewal plans and to create huge housing developments uh, for the low-income communities. As we all know, this was not the most successful uh, strategy in most cases. And today we're seeing a different strategy, um, one of inoculation or um, sort of instead of completely um, clearing an area and providing new housing for them, how can we create corridors and connections and sm much smaller scale I interventions in these communities to create more, uh, stronger connections between the different neighborhoods and different communities. Um, and this is really the sort of the strategy that we're, we, we've been trying to develop in the refugee scenario as well. Um, these sort of, these points of shared resources and community gathering between, um, not only for the refugees, but also really between the refugees and the host communities themselves. This can, this has the opportunity to create a much longer and more sustainable situation. So for example, um, just diagrammatically, if you think of the refugee camp, the blue circle and the existing host community, and um, I'll just point out in a lot of situations around the world, the refugee camp is a much bigger population than the existing host community, but they exist side by side. But as architects and planners, instead of putting the focus on the, um, the refugee, the planning of the actual camp, what if instead we could focus on shared resources and and gathering points in between that could be used by both refugees and the, the partner communities. Um, again, this is the most traditional sense where there is a bounded refugee camp, but today that's not representative of what is around the world. Um, there are lots of different typologies. Um, in more rural settings, there are, uh, it, it's much more appropriate to have smaller communities that are dispersed between the, the smaller host communities or partner communities. Um, also, we're, we're talking a lot about refugee settlements and refu refugee camps tonight, but in actuality, only about 20% of all refugees are, are settled in camps. The other 80% of them are all urban refugees. So we have to really think equally, if not more, about the urban situation. So the other two diagrams are, you know, urban lamination, when there's a really dense uh, downtown area already ex in existence, but a, a refugee community is um, it comes into play adjacent to that, how can we create new connections between those two communities? Or the the far uh, far right um, <laughs> the uh, urban integration um, in a lot of in a lot of places cities have had a declining population and now have a lot of vacant infrastructure. How can we reutilize that vacant infrastructure and provide an economic stimulus with refugees coming in so that at the end of the day, both the refugees and the, the existing community can benefit from the situation? So again, this is all dependent on how we treat and define and design these shared resources. Um, we, from, from sort of the very beginning, we've been, we've been trying to catalog how we, can, how we can design these shared resources. So if we take, just make a list of, you know, all the different types of things that each community needs, and then we take an inventory of what the refugee community has and can bring to the situation and what they're lacking, but also what the host community has and what they're lacking, then we can begin to find what both communities are lacking and use humanitarian aid to create shared resources that can be used by both, both communities. 
Um, and over time, more and more of these uh, resources can be shared between them so that at the end of the day, the refugees are not the only ones who are benefiting from this, but the host community is as well. And if we look at the situation this way, then you know, host communities should be competing for refugees to come rather than as they are today and not, not wanting them. Um, so the, the work that Eliza just showed and talked about was all kind of captured in this little pamphlet that we created called uh, Planning and Design Toolkit. Um, I think when we began it, we had the, the kind of classic, uh, we fell into the classic trap that architects fall into trying to create manifestos to, to save the world with. Um, and people keep saying, well, can we have the toolkit? And so yes, of course, you can have a copy of it if you want. But ultimately, I think the purpose that it served was it, it gave us a way to train ourselves and organize our own thinking and then use it as a tool to influence the people who really have the power to make a difference. So that's the UN, which I think UNHCR's budget, I might have this wrong, it was something like $3 billion or $7 billion last year. So it's a lot of money and it can make a big difference. So our thing, which has been in perpetual draft state for years, kind of begat this, which arrived uh, in our hands right around holiday time last year. It's an amazing present. So this is an internal publication of UNHCR that actually has adopted many of the guidelines and, and uh, theoretical underpinnings that Eliza talked about. So this notion of really changing the whole proposition of keep your refugees out um, and allowing politicians to manipulate the, the, the fear of incoming refugees as a way to uh, sustain their own position in a society and instead making, uh, uh, changing it so that actually there are instances now where towns do compete to receive refugees. Other things that developed in the toolkit um, are, you know, that, that kind of matrix that Eliza showed of, of resources. Well, how do you measure that? How do you figure out what the absorption capacity of an existing uh, place is to know how many refugees can it take in before something important breaks. So the UN has now developed some, uh, I think they're rudimentary tools, but they're using them to actually get at that. And that's a great way to deconflict the situation. So I'm gonna kind of roll back the clock to the very first charrette that we had with UNHCR when they asked us to, to help them plan a camp. Um, and we really didn't know what we were doing or quite what we were being asked to do. And after everyone went home, Eliza and I were sitting in the studio going, God, they're all going to come back tomorrow. And this thing is totally out of control. So we came up with this kind of framework to break down the problem and uh, identify the need for tools that kind of fit within each box in the matrix, understanding that you've got this, this, this axis of time that you have to solve for and also an axis of scale. Um, and then once we had that figured out, we could then kind of break down the problem a little bit further and start to think about among this matrix of tools, which are tools that architects can help develop. And many of them are tools that we can't on our own, which also points out an interesting uh, facet of, of this whole problem that no one discipline has the answers. And at least within UNHCR, many of the disciplines are siloed one from another. So we could, you know, in our naivete, begin to convene people who often didn't get a chance to talk to each other. Um, so you're doing macro? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Go for it. So we're just going to show a couple of, of examples of some of these tools that we've been developing. Um, so this is an example in the, in the macro scale. Um, this is a site selection tool. And um, one reason we, through a lot of conversations with UNHCR and with Stanford, one thing, one reason we realized the value of a tool like this is because today um, there is almost no choice in where refugee, where a refugee settlement is is put. Um, usually, it just happens to be wherever that government has some vacant land that they're willing to to donate for this, um, and oftentimes it ends up being the worst place, no, you know, not very good resources, uh, not very much connection to 
to communities around and to, and to support around. And so we started to think, well, could we create a tool that um, through GIS could gather different data layers, both environmental data and social data, about the larger region of, of where these refugees were, were um, going to move to. And um, based on each um, specific situation, could we then weight these data layers so that we can start to pinpoint what are the most crucial um, critical drivers for each of these situations. So for example, in an area where um, it's, it's hard to find good safe water, that would be one of the highest rated, um, highest weighted uh, data layers. Or for an area where um, education and, and schools are, are lacking, that could be a high, higher weighted area. And so then through this, you can merge these data layers and begin to see areas that are more positive places for refugees to move to and places that are more negative. And the, the r real idea behind this is that it can be a ne negotiating tool between humanitarian aids, host governments, partner governments, and hopefully the refugees themselves. And they can use it in decision-making sessions where they can really begin to shift these sliders to find a benefit for each one of them. If the host government is, is at the table and says, you know what, we really could use this humanitarian aid to improve our schools in this town as well, then that area all of a sudden becomes green and you see the benefit for both sides. And then you could zoom in and really sort of understand what is making up the more beneficial areas versus less. So the, the tool that Eliza just showed, she actually developed to a, a working beta platform together with uh, students from Stanford. What was interesting about it to me was, first of all, how quickly they were able to develop it and how planners at the UN, when they saw this, this mock-up, said, great, can we have it, can we use it? And of course, it's not really ready for use, but someone should be developing this. And then the other thing we learned is that a huge amount of really important data is, has been privatized, so you can't have it. So we tried a negotiation with Esri to, you know, will you help? This is a good cause, and they were pretty standoffish. So privatization of data is something that runs counter to um, developing uh, a tool like this, but I think ultimately uh, it is quite achievable. Um, this is a slide we haven't shown before. We actually got it from a colleague in the, in the Netherlands, uh, so we, we kind of cribbed it from one of his lectures. But this is uh, a camp in Palestine, um, so it must be probably 1948, 49, something like that. And uh, very quickly, what was temporary stuff starts becoming permanent, starts becoming fixed. And then here's, uh, or he told us, this is the, the same town today. So it's fascinating to look at, and all of you as planners and, and policy makers, you know, we'll, we'll certainly see how, you know, infrastructure begets urbanism. And there was certainly no thinking about infrastructure here. Then you wind up with, you know, these crazy ad hoc dysfunctional infrastructures in a place like this where if an ambulance can't get through, a fire can't be fought, the sewer system is probably terrible. Um, so w one of the other things that we've really been advocating for, and it's been it's got some some interest or some recognition is the fact that you know camp design if you're if you're still going to be involved in camps is really urban planning you can't call it anything else these are cities whether somebody's there for two nights or 26 years you're making a city you have to accept that a conundrum within the policy structure of the UN is that UNHCR is really a, a triage agency their mandate is not to be urbanist not to plan cities and so forth. So nonetheless, they're, they're really smart and they don't mind engaging a kind of guerrilla tactics and say, well, yes, you're actually doing it, so don't tell anyone and go to it. Um, so um, what were we going to say about this? So this is, I you, you want to do it? That sort yeah. of led us to, so um, <laughs> led us to the, the proposal this kind of a tool to the UNHCR, which is more of an idea of rotational planning because one, I mean, obviously, and there are still a lot of cases in the world where thousands of refugees are coming within one week's worth of time. And 
they need safety. They need a place to to be just you know for that moment. Um, that's still first and foremost the most important thing at that moment. But um, could we sort of have in as planners? Could we have a proposal where we in these areas we always leave a section of the camp um, un, uh, un, uh, vacant without tents, and then over time you could use kind of a rotational planning strategy where the refugees are, who are there could now be part of the planning process and begin to um, come up with ideas that will create a much more sustainable infrastructure plan so that we have a, a, smarter, a smarter situation. So this idea also is about how to introduce agency and how to, how to start giving it back to refugees who, when they first arrive, are in a state of extreme distress having um, you know, just escaped conflict. So if you can get them settled, you know, quickly and, and kind of stabilize the situation, if you can then create later opportunities to engage them in the development of their own community, that's kind of what that's about. And then kind of a, at the micro level, we also started developing some tools to relate the, the quantitative programming standards that come out of the UN's guidelines, you know, how many of this, that, or the other you need per, per unit of population, and turning them into some visualized, simp simplified vignettes, again, to help promote conversation and debate when you actually try to bring one of these formulas to a context and do it with kind of simple pictograms uh, with the idea that people who might not necessarily speak the same language could at least speak the same pictures and, and carry on some sort of a discussion. So I'll give you a quick, it looks like we've got about eight minutes left before Q&A, um, a, a quick uh, tour through, through this um, testing of the toolkit, which uh, this, I guess we started in 2014 or, mm -hmm. yeah, 2013. 2013, okay. So this was the, the charrette out of which that matrix grew that we held in our office together with people from Stanford and the UN. So the UN was needing to plan this site um, in Rwanda uh, to take in about 10,000 refugees uh, and they had about two months to plan it and figure out what to do. At the time, they had no survey um, and the topography in this part of Rwanda is really quite extreme. So they simply lacked the most fundamental tools to avoid catastrophe. So we developed some techniques within the office with, within our computing department to create a kind of rudimentary topographic model using imagery, imagery that at the time was available from Google Earth and devising scripts that could lay out shelters along contour lines so that you weren't kind of locked into this grid that um, would never have worked on the site. Um, the, uh, we were brought into the project probably two months later than we should have been because by the time we were getting involved, we were chasing problems rather than, than uh, leading with answers. So when we got to the site, there was already some, some pretty scary erosion beginning. Um, but nonetheless, some, there were some definitely some positives. But if you think of this as a success, the idea that in, in, in two weeks' time, you could convene a group of people with different perspectives and come up with a much better plan that's pretty good, and then we went out to the site and kind of calibrated it and tried to tune and, and provide some features within this plan that actually related to the culture and humanized it a bit more. And we probably don't have time to go through what's in all the little circles, but there were devices that we came up with to avoid you know, really horrible lines for people waiting for food or places uh, to celebrate or places that uh, would provide safe accommodation for women um, and who were not accompanied by a male head of household because they're at risk and so forth. So things like that. Um, we, this was the most recent engagement we had with the UN. This is a very different kind of camp situation. Um, these are old camps in Nepal. They've been there for about 20 years, 25. right? 25 years. So 120,000 Bhutanese were expelled from Bhutan. Um, and now about 20,000 people are left. So they've been kind of uh, de depopulating a whole bunch of camps. I keep moving people and, and concentrating them into what are now just two camps. 
And the people who are there are probably never going back to Bhutan, or it's, it's very unlikely. So the host government was starting to become receptive to what do we do now? And so we developed some strategies for integration that still kind of skirted some of the policy obstacles about permanence and, and right to work issues and things like that. So. And so in addition to some of these case studies, we've also been really working in, in a lot of different environments on how can this information be taught and explored and, and sort of shredded with di all different types of people. Um, the goal of doing these exercises both to, to transmit the information to people, but also to really hone in on the best ways to communicate with all different types of people. I think that is actually the most difficult part of this whole issue is that there are pol politicians and site planners and you know all different types of people who don't normally speak the same language. So finding ways to um, allow them to communicate better I think is, is really an important thing. So we've done a number of workshops and they have ranged from very short, just three hours long, to um, a, a multi-week long class at Pratt that we taught. But the idea is to, um, we, we've come up with these hypothetical situations that we've presented to the students and their task is then to kind of turn the situation on its head and really um, start to discover how, how the planning can be different so that, again, so that all sides can benefit from the situation. Um, one of the, the hypothetical situations that we gave to the students at Pratt are actually all based in the US. And of course, we all know this is completely hypothetical. Um, but for example, we said, what if 20,000 refugees were coming into Gary, Indiana? Um, Gary, Indiana is a city that has, a huge, has had a huge declining population since the 60s. Um, it, there's a lot of vacant housing, a lot of vacant commercial space in the downtown corridors, and, and a lot of vacant public buildings. So. Um, sort of, we were tasking them with this, this idea of how could the refugees bring their own skills um, and, and really provide a, a stimulus to this place to benefit both sides. Um, you know, we, we gave them other situations also that were different typologies. So what if uh, 10,000 refugees came to upper um, New York, uh, Sullivan County? Um, how could different strategies be used that would be more appropriate for that rural lifestyle? Or um, 10,000 refugees coming into uh, Des Moines, Iowa, which has a, a very strong downtown, um, but there is a lot of uh, vacant industrial land around. And then the most recent workshop we did at the new school um, we, we still use sort of the same kind of hypothetical scenario strategy, but I think one thing that we've added into this workshop that is, um, is really fascinating is to give all of the different, um, the, the students a role that they're playing. So we gave them all a story of either a refugee, um, a partner, someone from the host community, or a humanitarian actor, and their goal throughout the, the weekend long charrette was to represent that player and to really find a positive solution. At this workshop, we also had all different types of people. We had um, health experts, we had sociologists and anthropologists, we had IRC experts, and we even had futurists who were thinking about how this can change um, in, in 10 years or 20 years from now. And again, that sort of technique of finding ways to get people to, to talk together and to really um, find solutions. You'll also see in some of these images this um, paper with lots of post-it notes up. This is what we're, we call the propeller diagram. And so for every idea or issue um, that people came up with, they were, they were asked to put that issue on the propeller diagram uh, depending on whether it was a, something needed by the refugees from the humanitarians or by the refugees from the um, partner, govern, uh, partner government or vice versa. So the idea was to start to organize th all of the different ideas until you, were, until you honed it down to things that could be a benefit to all three sides. So just to kind of wrap up, um, I think what 
what we've learned is that architects actually can be activists and that architecture can be a, a tool for activism. I guess I just said the same thing twice. Um, but, uh, you know, th this is kind of what we're confronted with. You know, th th this, this is the situation. You have these people and then you have these diametrically opposed attitudes uh, about what we do about them. And I would even venture to say that both sides are probably equally ignorant about what will work. So that's an important thing, uh, at least I'm constantly reminded how much we don't know when we get into these situations. So there's a lot to learn, there's a lot of progress to be made and you can learn it, you can, you can make that progress, but don't assume that you know the answer until you really meet these people and ask them what their lives are about and what they need. So to just kind of close very quickly, shifting topics, uh, we wanted to give you a, a sense of how a project that's part of the lab, which is uh, sort of perpendicular to con conventional projects in the office, how this kind of thinking infuses other projects that we do. So one project right now is this fossil park that we're working on in uh, actually in New Jersey. That's a whole other story, but its point is to educate um, uh, visitors about you know this great acceleration, all these uh, scary things that are converging, and what are we going to do about it? So that then gets translated into a building solution and an exhibit program. Another one, this is a project that we competed for, um, and we may win. That's uncertain still, but uh, it's looking good. Uh, at, at Sing Sing Prison, which is to develop a center to explain how the criminal justice system works to the general public and also become a, a center f to explore um, the theme of restorative justice, which, you know, this is a, a, a problem that society has backed itself into that we now need to get out of. So I think with that, we'll stop and hopefully turn up the lights and you can comment and ask. having us. Yes. You made this happen. So I have a question. I mean, I just love this idea of it's such a hopeful idea to begin to create the processes that will create uh, a powerful integration of communities. And I'm, and I'm just wondering what you do or can you, even at the level that you're doing this of planning, um, help the host communities to accept in a very political level or um, a diplomatic level what's going to happen because all of their lives are changing and that's usually one of the places where there's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, is there anything in your toolkit that deals with that or do you pretty much leave that to the host community for their stewardship of this? Yeah, I think it, it kind of begins with that assessment of what is it that the host community needs but doesn't have? And if through humanitarian aid channels that which they need can be provided, you've now created something that can benefit both both communities and depending on what it is, you know, you, you could begin to imagine, although this hasn't really been tested very much, that you could kind of calm down the situation enough so that the communities can begin by coexisting peacefully. I think that's kind of where it begins. There's, yeah? So I, I can talk about that. Okay. Um, so when we're developing this toolkit, was there ever a fear that a lot of the approaches are very circumstantial to the crisis itself, the location? So, I mean, what, how did you approach the toolkit in that sense? Well, there, I mean, you're exactly right. There are lots of different types of situations. Some of them are, some, some of them lend themselves much better to integration. Some of them, because of cultural differences and political conflict, it's just literally impossible to hope that there will be integration. So we were, UNHCR was very upfront about that and, you know, wanted to make sure that we address both situations. And I think that, um, 
while it's harder to address the situation where there's so much conflict between the two different types of communities, there are still ways. Um, if you think about, uh, if you think about it on a less sort of interact personal interactive level, but there are still things that can be benefited from both sides through economic exchange um, and and through through sharing resources, even if there's not a direct physical connection. So that's sort of what we, um, we, we tried to develop those ideas as well. But to be honest, we haven't had as many case studies or as many um, as much experience in those situations just because they're so much more difficult to really access and understand. Um, I'll, 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 I guess I'll, I'll ask. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you have integrated um, the structure of funding mechanisms into the toolkit. So I did a little bit of work in Haiti with the American Refugee Committee after the earthquake. Um, and one of the, they were also looking to kind of strategize mm -hmm. longer term involvement with the work that they were doing. They were managing several camps. And so we were, we actually we came up with a very similar rotational diagram that you, that you all showed. And one of the impediments to that was that the granting mechanisms were such that you know, we said instead of building 1,500 temporary shelters, why don't you build 500 longer-term shelters and really think of these as a longer-term strategy? And they said, well, we can't because the grant we got was to deliver 1,500 or temporary shelters in six months and we have to spend the money. And so there were all these kind of built-in financial infrastructural impediments to some of those longer-term strategies. And I'm just wondering if you all have confronted that or tried to build that also into yeah. the tool. You know. Well, we've definitely confronted it. and. We certainly haven't solved it. Um, I, I think there's also there's some there are, there are particular characteristics of the humanitarian system, which you know there's so much that's good about it. So don't get me wrong, but it is a system, and it and it survives by its own standards of what it thinks is good. So capitalism and investment seem to have nothing to say about anything that we talked about. So maybe there, and you know, investment with a long-term uh, perspective potentially could be good if it was very carefully handled and regulated. So uh, I'm a bit suspicious of both, actually. So, and I don't know what the answer is. It would be really interesting to pilot some things that took some, some of the power away from the humanitarian mainstream and brought resources into the community through some other channel, ultimately with the idea of giving as much agency as possible to the people you see on the screen. Because in the end, there's so many outsiders who swoop in thinking they have the answer for what these people need, and nobody's actually asking them or just giving them you know, basic resources and, and having faith that they're as smart as we are, maybe smarter. I mean, and I'll just add to there were um, there was one interesting situation in the camp in Nepal that we recently helped with, where they and this is very common of a lot of the um, funding models, but they had a certain amount of money and they had to use it in within four months or else right, it would disappear. Right, right. And you know they weren't ready to actually build all the houses for the, that amount of money at that point yet. So through discussions with them and, and with the refugees themselves too, actually, we all agreed to s just simply spend that money to buy materials that could last. And then in the right time, the refugees could then build the houses themselves, which is a better model anyway. Um, and so, you know, it's really much more about sort of how, how to skirt around these rules for now and what kind of language that is used um, because if you just use a different word, sometimes it, it can work out. <laughs> and they were very receptive. They're mm -hmm. like, well, duh, of course. Let's just buy bamboo and sheet metal and we'll hide it over there. Yeah, I have the microphone. So, um, thank you. It was really an amazing presentation and you're doing a really important work. I'm, I'm blown away by the number of 143 million uh, until 2050 based on climate change, which means these are also going to be refugees that are not 
coming from, I don't know, developing countries to developed countries, but they are actually within nations. And on the one hand side, I think the topic you're dealing with has its own challenges, obviously, right? <laughs> so it's happening abruptly, there are probably no resources, there is no skilled labor on site to set up these settlements. All of this is already a tremendous challenge when it comes to design. But the other one is actually, I think it's what Karen said in the beginning, the political resistance that um, host nations or partner nations are willed to take on uh, refugees. I was just recently in Lebanon. I mean, they have one, one uh, force of the nation's population right. is a refugee population. These numbers are beyond what Germany talks about, etc. So one, one thing that I was um, thinking about when you said sometimes a word makes a difference. So if we would, on the one hand side, go and talk about Yes, there can be um, values and benefits for both sides. That's obviously some, some, something where we can meet on a stage. But it's also one way maybe to say we, we ourselves can be refugees to, refugees tomorrow. No, um, North California had a gigantic wildfire. There were whole settlements burned down, which means within nations we will have a similar situation that might be able to change the mindset on a political level. Did you ever encounter a situation like this where you thought, actually, it's not about them and us, it's about us and us, and we actually really have to change our mentality and attitude? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think you're right on, and um, I guess uh, the biggest task for that is just developing de developing tools and, and language for everyone to, to think that way as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, success, in, you know, meeting the challenge, it, it absolutely is going to rest on powerful, stable governments interceding because no one else is going to. So which form of government is going to be capable of doing that? Who knows? <laughs> I have a quick question about uh, the comparison between a uh, refugee encampment and an urban city. Do you think that there's any similarities that, because I saw a lot in a lot of your, your practice, you, you're using a lot of planning method in terms of planning these um, camp, refugee camps. So I'm just wondering, is there like a specific pattern that can be followed or is there like specific criteria that we need to focus on? Are, are you asking about differences in planning approaches in a for a camp situation versus an urban okay so uh, there are enormous differences and i think one of the reasons architects and planners have spent most of the last 60 years focusing on camps is you can imagine it you can draw it you can hold it in your head and it's not very complicated cities are far more complicated and the the interventions that you're going to make are probably not something you can easily systematize in a handbook. You have to go looking for kind of grassroots opportunities. They're going to be very localized. Um, anyway, help me out. Well, I mean, and also I'll just sort of bring up this handbook again that UNHCR recently published. If you compare this to their um, their standard refugee camp planning guidebook, which is still in use, but it's um, it's sort of, it's a little bit outdated at this point. But um, if you compare the two documents, this hardly has any plans and sort of dimensions of shelters and um, and guidelines for, for how much of a certain thing you need for square footage or that type of thing. It has a lot more uh, language about how to, um, under, how to understand and um, and analyze what a community has and what it has to give. So again, I mean, I think the the strategy for dealing with urban situations is less so much of like you know drawing drawing it out. It's more about um, it's more about understanding the data the data and where refugees can fit into that. country had a president who was 
an enlightened architect and activist, Belon de Carrick, and as the agriculture people moved from the Sierra, from the agriculture part to the cities, it was totally out of control in Lima, but in Arequipa, which was his uh, hometown, he got a hold of two backhoes, and one, uh, they went day and night expecting thousands of people to come down each week, and they dug water lines and uh, sewer lines. And as the people came in, these two rigs offered. They offered that, and they also offered as much reinforced uh, steel because it's an earthquake uh, region. And so they said, we will supply you with necessities of water and, and uh, sewers, uh, not electricity yet, yeah. and reinforcing rods. The cement, which could be locally derived, etc., and all the labor came. But your image of the Palestinian early yeah. camp and then the city that goes four or five stories actually worked well with time 50 years in Peru because mm -hmm. they came in and had Palomina, they had yeah. metal shacks and stone ones eventually, mm -hmm. and one story buildings and then two story buildings and three generations. And now I don't know if they're above four and five, but the ground level becomes shops and mm -hmm. industry and economy. And so it is possible to think of a camp uh, and a possible city if at least the two necessities of water and sewer are supplied mm -hmm. and you give people time because it's yeah. self-help in the end mm -hmm. and not external government yeah. ex besides the reinforcement yeah. rods, it's which was helpful. We're going we're to have to check out the history of, of that. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And you know, it, it called to mind you know, some of the, the, the impediments that we face now because so many countries have prohibitions against using permanent or durable materials to house refugees. So that was a big deal in Nepal. Um, you know, that camp that we just showed, people were forced to live in shelters made out of flimsy bamboo with bamboo roofs, even though there were ample materials around that they could work with. But by government decree, if you make it out of concrete or metal, it means these people are not going home. So 25 years later, they're, they're still there. So we, you know, we always try to think, you know, how, how can we be a little subversive here? And are, are there some tricks of language that we can suggest? Like, can we make an argument that a metal roof isn't a piece of permanent architecture, but what it actually is, it is a, a public health move because the person inside will stay healthier and not be a burden on the healthcare system because you can correlate these things. Um, so, you know, it's just one of those cases where, where you've got this big wall of problem and if you keep just keep butting up against it, it's not going to move, but maybe we can sort of kind of run around it and, and trick them. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, Your Honor. Well, I mean, uh -huh. I definitely there's. You're right. In, in upstate New York, there are a few really positive examples. Um, there all there's also a few really great examples um, in in Europe. Also, I was just reading about a small town in Germany. The mayor is about to get a big award because. Um, yeah, because he, he's invited a lot more than his share of refugees in, and consequently, the whole city is doing significantly better economically right now. I think in the U.S., I think Buffalo is one of those cities. It's it's um, mm -hmm. done really well recently yeah, because Patterson. of the refugees in Patterson. Yeah, which and isn't doing quite as well economically, mm -hmm. but it's, it's stable and welcoming. So right. it is possible, but it takes really great leaders. Yeah, yeah but, and I think, you know, as sort of, architects and, and also just planners who are always interested in representing information in different ways. I think that's, again, one of our um, tasks is to make the make these cases more visible to the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and hopefully other people will realize the benefits of it as well. Yeah, there, there, there's another kind of shift in thinking that I, I thought, you know, I realized somewhere along the way is kind of important that there's something about the whole humanitarian infrastructure that is kind of related to charity. Mm -hmm. um, and the giving of charity is definitely, you know, there's, a, there's an unequal power relationship there. And y you feel it when, when, you're, when you get close to it. So I think these mayors in places, in these towns in upstate New York, Paris and New Jersey, they're, they're not so much acting out of charity. They're, they're acting out of the self-interest for their community. And once they can establish that, they've got something to run toward rather than something to run away from or grudgingly tie the way. So that's, that's an important shift. Yeah. And just another thing, and your first observation made me think of this, um, the economic or the financial models of, of the traditional way that the humanitarian organization has worked also really needs a huge overhaul because in a lot of these camps that have been there forever, they have literally been, say, for example, trucking in water for 30 years. Yeah. And if at, that costs a lot of money. That's not cheap at all. And if they had spent all that money, or probably it would be a much smaller amount of money to just build the plumbing, and that would then support both the, both communities, that would be a much better use of the money. But because their financial models are always based on you have this amount of money, you have to use it this year or else it disappears. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all going home in two years. So right. <laughs> to your practice as we talk about a, a reciprocal relationship that it's not about giving charity but there's a generosity or an exchange that happens you know between populations and these projects what about your practice I mean you're a you know your firm is a big a architecture firm with all kinds of projects are the people doing this work also doing those projects you like how does it break down how does it play oh, out yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, I'll, I'll dispel the notion that any ad lab you know is a bunch of people and lab coats with test tubes <laughs> bubbling and things like that, and they're paid separately and they're independent. This is, I mean, a lot of it is just volunteer work. It's our nights and weekends over the last umpteen years, and all the other, m most of the other projects are like that too. It's just exploring questions that you have a passion for, and the office, you know, it's actually kind of fascinating. It's so easy to do. You just, all I have to do is encourage it. Support it a little bit, and it and it takes off, and it, and also just for the health of the office, it's it's an amazing thing because when you started in 2012, you know I had already been there for 22 years, and Eliza had just come. Was that your first mm -hmm. job? Okay, mm -hmm. so you know, kind of old guy, and she just came from school. We we just got to work together like equals, so and learn from each other, which is amazing. So mm -hmm. that kind of churn that it creates is, is incredibly healthy. But also it really does start to impact the way we do our other projects. Yeah. So, you know, we've, in a very obvious way, we've found ourselves using that propeller diagram in right. other projects with our yeah. clients and yeah. with the other user groups. Yeah. Or we've also used some of the workshop techniques that we've tested initially for this project in, in other uh, more client-driven situations. So, you know, there's a direct 
flu fluidity between the two, and I'd say the firm is benefiting <laughs> from it. Yeah. So, you know, the, the firm is, you know, I've pushed really hard for years to, to structure in a way that nothing gets too siloed, and it's, a, it's more of a, a web of connected people rather than departments. So this is just one other set of connections. question about architectural practice, if you look at the scale of how many people we're describing, and we look at the capacity of architects to actually address that scale, is there an issue in terms of a gap of capacity to design for these environments and to provide the kind of talent and resources? What percentage of the problem are we capable of dealing with today, yeah. and how do we address that get deficit if there is a, such a deficit? Yeah. I no one's ever asked us that, and you know we'd have to think about: is it even something you can measure? But what I'd like to believe is that doing some good is, if that's the best you can do, you do it, and then it kind of grows outward because there's just there's so much that's wrong with the current system, and 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 it has to the solutions have to come from kind of a redefinition of solving the problem that, that brings many different fields together in, in some form of collaboration. I think the architectural design aspect of it is really simple. I mean, that, that's not where the problem is. And we, we very intentionally, we have never designed a shelter because um, we felt so many smart people are, are working really hard on this. This is not, sorry, this is not where, let's go look at this other area where we didn't see a lot of people working with just kind of an organizational framework, a management framework, if you will. And as it turns out, architects are pretty good at managing complex projects. So that was an unconventional way to apply some of our skills. It may not have to do with architecture as directly, but it yeah. may have to do with the empowerment scenarios that you're describing. Yeah. And contributing to the theory more yeah. than the practice. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, we as architects should never be drawing plans for every different sh shift of population. We should be working with those communities so that at the yeah. end of the day, ideally, they're drawing the plans. <laughs> so I just want to offer, I guess, one last comment, and then we'll go out and eat some food. Um, it's almost what you're talking about relative to the communities is actually very analogous to long-term informal settlement dwellers across the global south. And so I work in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Nairobi is known for having extraordinarily um, large and very um, deprived um, informal settlements. And so a lot of the arguments you're making, I think, relative to uh, that diagram you had, right, where you had the host and you had the community and the shared things that they could do, you, you, know, you could really make the same arguments to bring governments along to recognize these these wants that are needed there. But what would be really interesting as you think about partnerships was if you were to present this in Nairobi or in Kampala, um, I'd be really curious to see how they respond, right? And, and getting planners and architects in the Global South actually being your partners. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did that in the Rwandese case or in Nepal, but it could be um, a super interesting way um, just because of different cultural lenses, different thoughts about design, what's appropriate, um, and how, how one might move forward. So it's just a thought about the future. No, it, it's a really smart idea because the, the, one of the differences, one of the, the challenges with refugee crises is they unfold so rapidly. I mean, you have two months to figure out what a site's about and plan the whole thing and put it together. But if we had relationships with other people in those same areas and studied their solutions, and had it and understood their communities and their their technology better, you could translate some of that into your planning thinking uh, in, in for the refugee settlement and probably be much better off. So great idea. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, thoughts? Shall we say thank you very much for our day? Thank you.